Welcome to the Adam Savage Book Club. We are in the library of my house, only a few short blocks from my cave. Uh, and me and my assistant Maggie here are asking questions today of Matt Parker of his new book, Humble Pie, being released in the, which well, just been released in the US. Is that just correct? That, yeah. You're traveling around, barnstorming, talking about it. Matt, um, I read this a few months ago when you sent me the UK version, and I have questions about that. But first off, like, give the broad overview. What is this book about? All right, so I had written a previous book which was much more about doing math. And I thought, you know what? It'd be nice to appeal to a wider audience of people. And one of my many goals is to get more people more excited about math. And I thought, you know what people like? Stories of disasters. <laughs> so, it's true. We totally as long do. as you're not living in it at the moment, it's, it's, it's entertaining. So I thought, you know what? I'll find loads of examples of when math has gone wrong. And kind of I was thinking, like there's so much math people don't appreciate going on behind the scenes. Right. Like, you know, in any kind of industry, and you're consequential using math. math exactly. Too. Exactly. And if it goes wrong, you know, like I say, big consequences. And so I thought, you know what? It'd be nice to get these entertaining stories of things going wrong. And then I can use that as an excuse to talk about the math behind the scenes. Nice. Now you use this phrase, getting people excited about math. Yeah. And the thing is that one thing um, modern education is really good at is achieving the opposite. Yeah, and the I, best case for a lot of modern <laughs> uh, education is getting people uh, resigned to math. Exactly. And, that, and, that, and that's, that's the best option. And I, and I think the thing that I found most surprising when I first became familiar with your work on Numberphile, uh, which is where I first encountered you, is the fact of your genuine excitement and thrill. And it, it engendered in me the same thing. So I was, you know, I think a lot of people are surprised to find out that mathematicians aren't people who are resigned to math at a higher level than they. <laughs> they yeah, actually yeah, find yeah, it yeah. exciting. Because people think mathematicians are just doing like longer and longer tedious calculations. <laughs> right. They're like, oh well, it's a living. Um, <laughs> but I think number file that could only have happened on YouTube, where we had absolute free reign because it was YouTube. Yeah. And Brady, who makes it, was just he, he contacted a few of us and was like, hey, I want to do this thing about numbers. And all we did was sit down and talk about what excited us about mathematics. And I don't think, I'm going to be careful with the sentence, I don't think mathematicians are that different to normal humans. I think they've just done a lot more learning and a lot more, like, it, it takes a lot of background reading to get into math because everything depends on previous bits. Mm -hmm. But what excites a professional mathematician is the same thing that will excite a normal person. What we tried to do was just show that, like this is why we love it, when the patterns line up, when it all works, when it's useful, and yeah, it seemed to work. Well, I mean, and that's just the thing is when the patterns line up, there are aspects to the landscape of mathematics where you find connections from one end to the other that are still not clearly understood, and that makes it a really exciting, we, we think everything's been discovered, but it hasn't. No, there's always, always more math. And it's that moment where you suddenly go, wait a minute, this looks familiar, and it looks like a thing that was over here. And I mean, like you say, often we've not drilled down far enough, but often if you can go down and you can kind of abstract it or get more theoretical, and then you suddenly find there's this logic that links, and it turns out they're both just manifestations of this deeper, I mean, I'd say like truth or something, but that's getting well, a bit, you know. And so that, that's kind of the dream, those <laughs> moments where you suddenly realize that these things are connected. And you can do that at any level. So obviously professional mathematicians mm -hmm. are doing it at the forefront of human knowledge. But even like, I'm a rec recreational mathematician, right? So I'm, <laughs> I, I mess around with it. And even then I'll be doing something and I'll, I'll, I'll have a sequence of numbers or something and go, wait a minute, that rings a tiny bell. And that's kind of an unfair advantage. Like if you watch someone who's been doing math for a long time, they'll go, oh, hang on, this is, and like, oh, I recognize, this is Pascal's triangle. Right, this is, right. this, these are the prime numbers. And it's just because you spent so long doing it, you, you build up this intuition. But those, can, I, so I, just the, my final story about number files, I will be lying in bed watching number file videos with my headphones on, and my wife will turn to me and go, are you crying about <laughs> math? And I'm like, geometry <laughs> is so gorgeous. <laughs> Um, so you talk about um, a recreational mathematician. Yes. Um, a, as a serial recreationalist in all, all the skills that I know, um, I have in the past joked that um, I, what I like to do with a skill is get to learn it until I'm better than most people at it and then I drop the progression. So I, I, I'm the patron saint of mediocrity plus one. Mm -hmm. And in that vein, I'd like to talk about the Parker Square, which is my favorite part of this book. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful uh, a wonderful analogy for iterative learning and oh, discovery. Good. Well, thank you. So what is the Parker Square? So the Parker Square, 
This started when, because I sit down with Brady, who makes Number File, maybe every couple of months, a couple of times a year, and we'll film a whole bunch of videos. And I'd wanted to do one on something that we don't know yet, which I also find the math we don't know, I find that fascinating. And Because there's some fairly understandable questions that are easy to parse that are still unanswerable, right? And that's the great thing about math, because mm -hmm. the simplicity with which you can state the question in no way correlates to how complex the answer is going to be. Do you be. have an example? So the, um, there's a famous one called uh, the Collatz Conjecture, which is just one of these sequences. If you take a number and if it's odd, you double it, and I think, or you, and if it's even, you you divide by three or something. Like there's two very simple rules which uh, people are now yelling at their screens. Uh, <laughs> they, this is how much I care about the Collatz Conjecture. And so um, with these two simple rules, every number ends up at one. But you can state them very easily, so easily, I don't even bother to remember them. <laughs> um, but proving that that always happens has evaded all mathematicians. Oh, like, so every no time you try it, in any circumstance, it yields it the same one. answer, yep. but you but, can't but prove But we why. cannot prove that definitely happens every single time, which I find just find amazing. Um, there's a whole thing called perfect numbers. These are numbers where if you add all their factors, all the numbers that divide into them, you get back the number you started with. No one's ever found an odd number for which that's true. No one's ever managed to prove it that there is no such odd number. We don't know. We don't know. And the Parker square was, <laughs> if you have a magic square, so these are where you've got a grid of numbers, and if you add the columns, you get the same total every time. You add the rows, you get the same total every time. The diagonals, very importantly, it turns out, you get the same total every time. <laughs> and uh, magic squares have been studied for m millennia. Uh, Benjamin Franklin famously came up with a bunch of magic squares. So, oh, wow. uh, recreational mathematicians over the generations have looked at these things. And an obvious question is, hey, if it's a square, have we tried square numbers? And oh. uh, people have found bigger magic squares with square numbers. No one had ever found a three by three magic square where all the numbers were themselves square numbers. You thought that was a worthy challenge. I thought I'd give it a go. And so, like yourself, I'm like, I was like a poly, a poly, Nerd, I become sufficiently obsessed with a lot of different things. Poly nerd, as, a div as opposed to polymath. As opposed to polymath, that, that, right. that implies too much mastery of the subject. <laughs> sure. Whereas, like you, like, like I learned to solve a Rubik's Cube faster than 99% of people. Those <laughs> remaining 1% are like, person's taking forever, right? But everyone else thinks it's incredible, right? Right, right. I, I do like mental calculation tricks better than most people, but, but the pros are like, this is useless. And so I thought I'd pick up programming as a hobby. And so I was learning uh, Python, fantastic programming language, I highly recommend. And I thought, oh, this would be a good exercise. I will see if I can program a way to search for these um, types of magic squares. So build a program that would run through iterations until hopefully it sifted out a magic square. Exactly. And um, that, some people think that it sounds like you've taken all the creativity out of it, whereas I find programming is an incredibly creative, um, a, a, well, there's just the actual coding, but there's also thinking, how am I going to do this search? And so I basically searched square numbers and put them in categories based on what their sum was. And they had another program which would go through all these categories and find ones which could sufficiently you, overlap. You did a number file video on programming maths software that I found really impressive for the way it required a specific way of thinking through tackling the problem. Like exactly. That's, it's not trivial. And that was my goal because uh, uh, in so many videos I realized I was saying, and I programmed this. And I was like, you know, I should actually show the yeah, process. Yeah. So I started from scratch with a new problem I hadn't tackled before. And in that video, I went through and showed how you put the code together. For the Parker Square, I, I wrote the code, I ran it, and then I analyzed what came out the other side. And I ended up with this one square, which kind of worked. <laughs> so in my defense, it was pretty good. It, there were, uh, of the nine numbers, three of them were repeats. And I mean, I admit, if you start going down that path, because I could have just had all ones. Right. <laughs> that fulfills all oh, the so requirements, right? So there is something right? that yeah. satisfies the condition. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, <laughs> so I accept I was one step along that path. In fact, it's symmetric along one diagonal. So in, in some regards, I got half a square and just copied it in the other bit. Mm -hmm. um, also, one of the diagonals doesn't work. So one diagonal <laughs> Wait, matches. only one just, diagonal. <laughs> only one. <laughs> What's one diagonal, huh? Right? There's, there's a spare one that works. Um, and so one diagonal didn't work. And so in the video, I'm talking like to, to Brady who's filming and I'm going through all this stuff. And I, I get to the point, and I, here's what I found. And he's like, oh, it's not very good. I'm like, hey, <laughs> I found that, that's mine. He's like, oh, what's it called? And I was like, I am not gonna call it the Parker Square. 
because then everyone would be like, oh, uh, if something goes wrong, they'd be like, ah, oh, classic Parker Square. And Brady was like, don't worry, I won't make a big deal of it. And so he named the video the Parker Square. Yeah, it's he the... released a line of T-shirts. <laughs> well, I was on tour at the time. And later on that tour, my tour manager shows up with the biggest grin on their face wearing a Parker Square T-shirt. They're not even into math. But they just knew that wearing this was a form of casual bullying, and so <laughs> they went with it. Uh, and there's mugs and everything. And um, I mean, as you said at the very beginning, I I kind of I was like, I'm okay with this. I think right, this is right. fine because I think it's a mascot for giving it a go. And if there's like one of the morals of the story, even before I read the book, but now very much in the book, is math is about giving it a go. And people remember it from school and think, oh, it's all about getting the right answer. And it's not. Math is about trying and playing with numbers and patterns. And the bulk of the time, you're going to get it wrong. And, and every now and then, you get a little bit closer. Well, and the, with all the sciences, the, the deeper you scratch, the grayer right versus wrong exactly. comes, yeah. right? It's, it's the, everything bends at a certain point. Yeah. And so I was like, look, it, I'm happy for this to be out in the world and just to become this kind of it's taken on its own life as a kind of online meme where there's just this sense now in a certain corner of the internet and people, and hopefully young people watch the videos and mm -hmm. they grow up, just this sense of in math, it's okay to give it a go. And just because you don't get it totally correct doesn't mean that it was a fail. Look, eight out of nine, that's totally sufficient for me to oh, move exactly. on. Bingo, that's plenty. <laughs> What is that, like an 88%? Seven from eight. Okay, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, All right, I, we got some questions from fans. They have been reading the book, and these questions are terrific. Um, I So someone said, how hard, uh, how hard did you work to make the book pi times 100 pages long? And I, I know from speaking to you that you may have had some ambitions about pagination in the book that the publisher was reticent to, um, to explore. Yes, yes. <laughs> The nicest way anyone's put it. Um, my publishers had a different phrasing. So, <laughs> so I enjoy uh, messing around with the page numbers. And for some reason, all books are very locked in how they do page numbers. So if you grab any of the books off the shelf here, I can almost guarantee they will have, they're all going to have odd page numbers on the right, yep, and they're going to yep, have yep. even on the left. And you yep. click it open, there yep. we go. Every single and it's one. odd on the right, yep. even on the left. Yep. My um, previous book, I started on page zero. Which flips it. It means from then on, it's always even on the right, all on the left. I thought that was hilarious. Did people did people find people that People found upsetting? it funny, right? But they just kind of they they start the book, and at the very beginning, the first page um, has a zero on it, and they're like, "Oh, ha ha." Um, this time, I tried two things. So the, the zero is still in there, mm -hmm. but also it counts backwards. <laughs> so at the beginning of the book here, it like it starts on page three hundred and eleven. And then the next one's 310, and then 309, and it continues to count down. And I had so many stories in the book where often in computing, a system would be set up where they assign a big number and then count down routinely, often to keep track of time or progress. Oh, okay. And when it hits zero, it would then cause the system to crash. And so I found there was like an air, like in Southern California, an air traffic route control center, all their computers turned off because of exactly this problem. And they lost contact with hundreds of aircraft. So this which, is because they had just left the computer on for too long. For too long. Uh, and it hit zero and crashed. Uh, and this has happened so many situations. And often it's caught. Or like you say, if you restart often enough, it fixes the problem. So uh, just as a briefly, brief aside, I was uh, at a conference a couple weekends ago talking to some security researchers, which is always a terrifying conversation. Oh my goodness, yeah. But one of the things that I realized in speaking to them is, oh right, a chip a computer chip is nothing but hundreds of millions of little stopwatches. Like yeah. that's one way yeah. of looking yeah. at it. Yeah. And then when you look at it like that, a timeout error becomes, oh, of course that of course would happen that happens. from yeah. time to time. And people often say, why are you counting down? Same thing would happen counting up. That's not going to fix the problem. It's still going to, it's a finite amount of space. Okay, it's what did you want to do that the so, publisher could provide? So anyway, provide. it counts down to zero, then it crashes. And oh, the page, actually... the page numbers, I don't know if you spotted this, because it's right at the back where it gets boring. No, they roll over to just over four billion. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a 32-bit uh, encoding on my page numbers. Uh, but the actual question here is it starts on 314. And that was half happy accident, half I using up more goodwill with my publishers. Because I had to put a note to right. explain that they're going backwards. That was they like were legally terrified. that Because if there are any complaints or people return the books or complain to Amazon that there's a mistake, 
boom. Like it just get, Amazon just shut it down. Oh really? And my publishers were just so nervous that would happen. So oh. the compromise was a note. It literally says, please don't take it back for a refund. Right? This is deliberate. <laughs> but the, um, the 10 times, sorry, 100 times pi starts on 314. When I realized it was gonna be close, I just said, look, early on when we're typesetting, I went, it's yeah. gonna be close. Do you mind if we um, basically shuffle back where zero is gonna be? And then normally they wouldn't number this page. Like this is right. a totally blank. Normally the page yeah. numbers would yeah. start like here, I said, look, would you mind rolling where it starts back a little bit so it starts at 314? So it was it was a half happy accident, <laughs> half half by design. That's fabulous. Um, on page one, uh, here's, I love this. On page 197, you do the McDonald's updated calculation for the meal subsection, you count two picks of three meals as six. Wouldn't it be three times three equals nine? Was that one of the intentional errors in the book? How do you I like love, being challenged by your fans? I love my fans so much. <laughs> um, so, so I get so many emails from people who found mistakes in uh, videos and uh, books. It's a good thing I've kind of made that on brand for me now. Right. You'd be, you'd be uh, amazed what I can get away with. Yeah. But yeah, no, oh, that's just my thing. Um, <laughs> so, so specifically, this was, uh, there was an advertising campaign McDonald's around the UK in 2002, and they promised more combinations of food than they could possibly deliver. They had eight items on their menu, mm -hmm. and they promised over 40,000 possible combinations. 40,312, to be specific. And there's, it's I'm interesting curious how story. they were counting. Oh, it's so, <clears throat> so fascinating. <laughs> like, the way they got that number, how they got it wrong, they, there was an, a, um, people complained to the Advertising Standards Authority. McDonald's had to go to court and oh show God. their working out. And uh, I think that you show that they were really, they were working towards a, a genuine answer and some good faith. Yes, oh yeah, yeah, they, they, and I totally get where it happened because they would have been brainstorming how are we gonna get the McDonald's advertising account. I know, why don't we just look at the combinations? And that they did what you'd kind of half remember from school. But right, no one right. ever, no one double checked it. And, and this incorrect number ended up in the advertising campaign. I just thought I would explore, hypothetically, <laughs> What are the bounds on a reasonable meal? So as if they had a genuine mathematician in the room as they yeah. were brainstorming, what exactly, would you exactly. have counseled them? <clears throat> and you could have, because you can just work it out, how many ways can you choose a number of items from eight options? I thought, no, no, let's think about it as a human. there's a lot of doubles in that when you do that. Well, exactly. Yeah. I was like, well, hang on, what if it was actually a meal? What if you want to have a thick shake for a starter and a dessert or this or that, right? And so I went through and did this calculation. The specific question here is I have done uh, six, what have I done? I've done three, what was the complaint? Uh, two picks done... of three meals as six. You count two picks of three meals as a six. So I've done three, choose two. What have I done? <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have let's to check, let's check this live on stage. What page number are they? Uh, 197. 197. That, it's, thank you, by the way, William, on Twitter and YouTube uh, for including the page. Because I've got a sneaking suspicion they are right. <laughs> Meal options. Here we go, here we go. Uh, okay, so I'm allowing people to have a no main, one of those, three options, or two of those if they're really hungry. So what have I done? Ah, right, so they think I should have allowed this to be picking the same thing twice versus choose well, two of these. I don't think people would have no main, one option, one of the three, yep. I think yeah, I think they're right. I think they're right. But it was, I'm, I'm guessing it's not an intentional yeah, error. No, that's not an intentional error. Okay. I think, uh, yeah, I think the rest of this video should me, be me double checking this calculation. <laughs> um, no, okay, I will, I, will, I will check that thoroughly later. At the back of the book, I have a long list of people who sent in legitimate corrections. Oh. And if they're the first person to send in a correction and I change it, their name goes, Oh, fabulous. In the next edition. So I'm, I fully embrace people pointing out my mistakes. Yeah. I don't know why I'm saying that. No, yeah. Um, so honestly, if you find it, send it in. And then at the back here in the acknowledgements, there's a growing list of people who, here they are, who, um, are zero day discoveries. 
So if there's a <laughs> yeah, right. little, uh, little security As joke published. there for you all, yeah. Um, and then the, you, you can see now there's like, it's over two lines of people who sent in wow. uh, corrections that I've made. So, um, and again, all my videos online start with, underneath them in the description, is a section for corrections. Oh, wow. And okay. it's there by default, and it starts by saying, none yet, let me know if you spot any, and then they gradually fill in. So brilliant. Um, I love this question from Neil Russell on YouTube. <clears throat> he says, I'm a teacher from Scotland here. Uh, Adam and Matt, what do you think is the key to helping change the next generation, their fear of maths? As a teacher, I constantly see students write off maths at an early age because they're stuck in the belief that only certain people can do it. Any tips on how to capture their imaginations and to inspire them so that they can enjoy it? I'm curious, what is your origin story of the first time you found maths thrilling? That's an interesting question. Uh, I'm probably, I would have been too young to remember. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate in that my uh, dad was an accountant and my mum was a librarian for the most part. And from a very early age, I was given math problems to do at home before I went to school. Really? And so I, the That's first- That's just a family recreation? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. I, and they tricked me. They were like, hey, this is fun. It's like, it was a treat. <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, I'll do some math. Uh, and the first opinion I remember having about math is that I preferred addition to subtraction, but I realized all the subtraction ones, I could turn them into little plus symbols and then do, do the adding up, right? Oh. And it was, I found it so pleasing. And when I went to school, I had this rolling start of hooray math. Whereas right. everyone else, and, and I saw this when I was a teacher, because I worked as a high school math teacher for four years. At parent-teacher night, you would, I would see parents say to my face with their kid next to them, oh, I was never good at math, so of course my kid's not good at math. And I'm like, don't give a teenager an excuse to never. not learn. Never. Like, they're going to take that and run with it. And the difference, like, even just that, when you start learning math, having the attitude of, oh, this is difficult, Yeah, I'm not good at it, versus uh, this is fun, I'll give it a go, makes all the difference. And as soon as you get behind in math, it gets harder to catch up. And kind of the point, and this is not gonna solve their problem, enthusing right. young people, but what I think is the major issue is people who, who struggle with math, look at the people who uh, do a lot of it or enjoy it or do it for a living and think, wow, they must be really good at math. They must come to them naturally. And that's not true. The people who are into math are the people who enjoy the fact that it's difficult. They enjoy that they have to struggle with it. That's part of the appeal. And it's not, don't get me wrong, it, it helps that if you immerse yourself in it, you get very good at it and you build a bit of an intuition around it. Well, in the same way that the, that the, that the crossword puzzles are difficult and Sudoku exactly. is difficult. These are, these are things we use to challenge our brains. The, 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 the realization, I think, that everyone I've met who loves maths loves it because they see they see something unknow, unknowable about it. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Like that's the in school when you teach it as a bunch of tests and things to memorize, you're teaching it as facts that you either know or don't know. It's binary. But the reality okay. is way more. Yep. And the reality is, don't get put off when you struggle because you're always going to struggle. And you're teaching because your brain, the human brain, is not good at math naturally, but it's very good at learning it. But the learning it is a struggle and it takes effort and you're going to make mistakes. And I think the secret is to not be disheartened by that, but to enjoy the journey of, of, of your adding to your you know, toolkit of, of uh, problem solving and thinking techniques. Well, so I remember for me, I actually have a very specific pairing of things that happened. I was uh, in a, a freshman in high school. And, no, 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 excuse me. It was middle school, it was seventh grade. Right. Now that I remember the teacher. And it was one of those um, logic puzzles of, you know, Mary works three days a week, Brian drives to work, and it's all these disparate yeah. facts, and somehow you have to find that commonality. And the teacher gave it to us to work on for a period, all of us failed, and then the next period was spent looking at it algorithmically. And I found myself fascinated that the way to solve these things was not, you couldn't just build an equation to solve for it. You actually had to build an equation, start plugging in numbers, and screwing up to kind of see the direction or trajectory you wanted to go in. Cut to about six or eight months later, some friends of my parents showed up and they gave me this puzzle that was a series of radial levers um, uh, on platters with different cut holes in them. And right. the puzzle was to get the levers, which all started on the outside of this puzzle, to the inside of their okay. travel. And it was all clear. And I was looking at it and I could see that there was a 
a plus one aspect to the stacks of things. And I realized that the same algorithmic thinking I had learned from this word puzzle applied to this. And like 12 year old me wasn't thinking that I like maths, but I was like, oh, this is figurable. And I sat there with a piece of paper and I started to draw what I could see the structure. And then I solved the puzzle in like an hour. There you go. It was, and there were like 19 million combinations. And I was like, right, but it's yeah. just an order plus well, one. We can exclude a lot of them. <laughs> we yeah. can. Uh, and for me, that that moment of taking on the difficulty and coming to a solution using something that came from a place that didn't seem like it had a connection was deeply thrilling. And that almost answers the question. It's how do you recreate that in a classroom for kids? Right. And, and that's the challenge. And a lot of teenagers, I mean, you can motivate them because there's an exam <clears throat> coming up or something, but it's difficult. And in the UK and Australia, where I've taught them both, we are so low on enthusiastic math teachers. Right. Because if you get a math degree, there's a lot you can do with it. Right. And <laughs> your best paid option is not becoming a, a, a school teacher. Right. And so we kind of rely on people who become math school teachers because they think it's a good thing to do, which is not a good way to start an industry. Right. And so we just haven't got enough enthusiastic teachers because the creativity and effort required to give students that kind of epiphany moment where they, instead of just learning the tools of math, they get to see how they're used. That's, that's when you get a kid hooked. Did you, did you have uh, any go-to, like, catch your attention uh, lectures that, that seemed to resonate with your kids? I used to do a lot on magic tricks. Right. So there's a lot of self-working card tricks. Our friend Richard Weissman is a wonderful yes, collector of exactly. such things. And so, uh, and so I keep, like, I have a lot of friends who are magicians, which I think is a good, good balance. There's a real crossover between mathematicians and magicians. Well, there really is, there really is. There's a lot. And so I um, loved card tricks as a kid. And so now all these self-working ones, they're mathematical, yeah, almost by definition. Yeah. And so I would get self-working card tricks and I would get students to reverse engineer how they work. And then they could then use that to make their own card trick. Ooh, right. And so the extra layer of, because what I love about it is if you just memorize the steps, you can do that trick. Right. And that's a bit like how most people learn math. They memorize the steps, they can do that specific problem. But if you understand the logic behind it, you can then bend it to your will, you can change it, you can come up with a new trick. And as an analogy for learning math, I was like, ah, oh, what, a, what a moral to the story. And, <laughs> and, and kids love, like you say, you got an exam, you're gonna need to learn this, or uh, one day you'll have to get a mortgage, things that really excite teenagers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's not gonna work. Whereas if you learn this right now, you can annoy your friends and family. Instantly. You got them on board. Absolutely. And yet you're still getting the same critical thinking, problem solving, puzzles, spotting patterns. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, that's a great intersection. Um, I've right. got, uh, I'll flag it up, because obviously I've written a book that you pay money for. We wrote a free PDF download guide to using math magic tricks to teach math. So I'll we can give include you a link it in the comments you can download below. It for free. Fabulous. It's all there. Um, this, uh, okay, here's from Johnny DL on YouTube says, the book contains a chapter that touches on the Millennium Bridge and the Tacoma Narrows disaster, a uh, famous Washington Bridge that you've seen footage of buckling in the wind. Um, uh, Mythbusters, we tried to test the myth and struggled greatly as I recall. Um, and the person's asking if I have any thoughts since my second attempt uh, and do you have any advice on why our first test failed so badly? Oh, I know why I, why our first test failed so badly. And the difficulty, the thing that I learned in testing this, which you probably know, is that bridges are way over-designed. Oh, yeah. Bridges are massively, massively, redundantly designed to be, like, way more, like, when I'm, hang, when I'm like, lifting something with rope, I'm always looking for a four to one safety advantage, which means okay, I yeah. want all of my equipment to break at four times the maximum weight I'll be using. That makes me feel comfortable. And that's with a, what you call a live load, something that swings. If it was a static load, I might go with a three to one. But bridges are built at like a 10 or 20 or 50 to one mechanical advantage. So I remember I did a little bit of civil engineering when I was at university and one of the units we would spend ages with the calculations working exactly how much load all the parts could take. And I used to love it getting right into the details. Right, right. You get to an answer and they're like, right, now just slap another zero on the end <laughs> and, there's, and there's your number. Right. And I'm like, all that working out to just order, like magnet, multiply it by to 10. To increase it. And that's what you built, yeah. And so for us, the difficulty we had in testing is building a bridge 
that's right on the edge of falling apart so yeah. you could test what makes it fall apart is actually its own engineering challenge that's really quite really difficult. Is. I did some lectures recently with Hannah Fry, who does mm -hmm. uh, number file. There's a thing in the UK called the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures that every year they're science lectures. Hannah and I did them just gone, and we wanted to show the Millennium Bridge yeah. doing this wobbling thing. And there was no way we could make our own rig. So we borrowed one from the research people at uh, Cambridge University yeah. and rigged up this massive thing that they had spent ages honing and building. <laughs> and the platform was able to move in one direction and we put treadmills on it. Oh. And then we got people walking on oh, the treadmills. Wow. And, that's, and that is what we found then showed this one specific uh, what a movement. great execution. Yeah, that's that, really that did cool. it. It's tough because when, <clears throat> did you have, you had steps going up and down? We had steps going up. <clears throat> it was actually a huge argument from Jamie and I. Right. And I don't mean to unpack it here, but I will just for a second. <laughs> which was, uh, Jamie built these robots, which were exceedingly cute and hilarious, because what they were was a, um, a air ram that worked as a Ooh. semicircle. It, uh, so it was a, a pneumatic cylinder that turned a quarter turn when you activate it. it. Yep. And so we had a boot on each one and it would do this. My problem was the periodicity was never going to be accurate to the millisecond because of the amount of a loss of feedback with air. You needed a mechanical. And we had this huge, huge argument about it. And he won the argument because we would do that for each other. But then later on when it didn't work, I was pissed. Yeah, yeah, that's, because uh, <laughs> obviously I've worked, I've worked with a lot of people and I've always you got to wonder, do I want to later on be able to say, oops, sorry, or told you so? And, <laughs> and so one of the things that I had in my head that I've learned over the years is if someone says to me something spectacularly not the right idea, I think to myself, do I need to solve this problem right now or will the world solve this problem yes. for will me later? Will the universe later? close this for me? Yeah. And waiting for the world to solve it has been a real grace in oh my, my life. Uh, with the problem we found, the reason we put humans on treadmills is specifically we were looking at the Millennium Bridge, which is right. this bridge in and London. The Millennium Bridge, the feedback loop was such that when people felt the bridge moving, their method of attempting to stop it was actually exacerbating the problem. That's is exactly that right? the problem. It was this um, feedback loop. And the Millennium Bridge was very well engineered for the kind of up and down stepping. And it was this unexpected side to side. That was like about a Hertz or yeah, something that's a, yeah, like that? Yeah, a human walking is about a, a, a Hertz uh, pendulum side to side. And when the bridge was moving, you get like this, it's like being on a ship, right? Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. can't, you start, you start stepping into the, the You swing. anticipate where the movement's yeah. gonna be. And that meant that more, as soon as people do that, they, they're adding energy to the system and that causes more people to fall in step, which adds energy and eventually you get look, like a third of the people on the bridge were all working, walking in perfect unison. <laughs> Incredible to watch. And that was enough to make it move about 10 centimeters. And so they had to close it on is the there, second day. Is there any news footage where you can clearly see yeah. it? Oh. Yes, yeah, oh. yeah. If you look that. online, there's footage they found. And to recreate it, they got people and they gradually had more and more people and marched them backwards and forwards across the bridge. To test to it. To test it. Oh. And the, the rig we were using for the Christmas lectures was part of that research, but the people who built it don't want to be mean to the one company that made the Millennium Bridge. Sure. Because other bridges have had this problem. There but for the grace. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and what makes it work though is it's the human closing the feedback loop. And even on, because it was a bridge in a town called Salford outside Manchester, which was the, the original one with the troops marching across. Yeah, uh -huh. um, and I think if you've got any kind of mechanized attempt to recreate that, you're going to lose the human closing the feedback loop. It's because it's a moving target. Yeah. If you try and do it at a rigid periodicity, you, you could eventually right. find you a could harmonic, find it, yes. but humans don't work that way. No. And, they, and, they, and even the ones on the bridge, the contemporary a, stories, they started whistling a tune and they all started, they all started right. like going, really going for it. It was hilarious that the bridge was moving. So they all deliberately start walking at that. Frequency. So this is akin yeah. more to pushing someone on a swing, which isn't a yeah. regular periodicity, but it is, um, it's not exponential, but it carries, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, you need something in there, which is going to tune itself to that resonant frequency. And then uh, because humans will, will lean into these things, yeah. literally and figuratively, <laughs> um, that works. You can do it the other way, where you just happen to hit it. And there was a building in South Korea around 2011, if I remember correctly, where it was a 38 or nine story building and people at the top one day found the whole building was moving and they evacuated, think it was an earthquake. It wasn't. It was an exercise class 
on the twelfth floor <laughs> who happened to exercise to snaps. I've got the power, and that I'm not going to sing it. You know the song. Uh, and that frequency. CNC Music Factory. I, oh no, it was a German. Is very that, similar. No, snap. 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 I'm sorry. Oh wow, we have a pro. And there you are. <laughs> snap, snap exclamation point is the band. There Thank you, you Kayla. That's the correct pronunciation. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and that, the, the frequency of that happened to match the frequency which this building, this was a, a um, torsional instability. So the building was, was twisting along its kind of center. So when is somebody gonna figure out, like attach a pencil to the corner of the building and somehow figure out that that is some way to determine pi? I, oh, I don't. <laughs> That's a whole other question. The look on your face is awesome right there. Because actually, maybe you'll be up for this. There's, um, you know, the amount of compressive force to make a beam buckle? No. So, well, it, I mean, it's, it's, well, yeah, you're it depends upon the beam, right? Yeah, okay. The actual calculation for the compressive force for buckling a beam has a pi in it. Oh, really? So in theory, I've, I've been umming and ahhing about this for years. If you had a, a, a beam, like, like a very thin rod fixed at one end, and you knew its properties very accurately, you could calculate pi by the amount of force required for it to buckle. So this is what we're getting into is this wonderful bit of esoterica about math, which is that there are weird and amazing ways to calculate pi that the deeper you look into it, the more they will blow your mind. And it involves like throwing sewing needles onto a grid is a possible way to determine pi. There are ones about, I mean, someone was just telling me one last weekend that was so surpassingly strange. My, I can't even remember it because it was really late at night when I was told it, but like, you go down this rabbit hole and it yeah. gets as deep as you want to get. And that's why it's a very good example again of most people think math and by extension pi is just about calculating circles or memorizing the digits. It's about, you know, just this tool that you're going to use in one very specific example. But actually, mathematicians, like pi would not be the poster child of math if it was just circles. It's the fact that it appears in so many unexpected situations. And so I'm always looking for weird places where pi pops up and then using it to calculate it. And my favorite is the period of a pendulum. The equation for that has a pi in it. So if you get a pendulum, which the length of it is a quarter, the acceleration due to gravity, it takes exactly pi seconds for it to swing. <laughs> so I put a pi on string oh. and say, you know, you know how this goes, right? And then I calculate a pi by swinging a pi. Good times. I love it. Um, I think this is a great last question. Thomas Morningstar on YouTube says, how do you think people should address mistakes? Wow. Yeah, I mean, learning from them. I guess that sounds so obvious when I say it. And it's like the Parker Square, right? I embrace the fact it was wrong, and I think it's useful. And that's a very, that's a very scientific stance, right? You want, as a, as, a, as a casual mathematician, but as a scientist by bent, you, you want to have your mind changed. You want the data to bring you the information, exactly. whether it matches what you previously thought or not, right? Against our human nature, we strive to update what we believe based on new evidence. And so if we have a mistake or something doesn't work the way we expect, we should not only update that, we should tell other people about it. And I allude to this in the book, because I don't want to get into any legal trouble, but I, part of writing the book was talking to people I knew or approaching people and trying to get their examples of when math has gone wrong in their industry. And so many times, time and time again, I couldn't get any examples because they weren't allowed to share them. They weren't allowed to make them publicly available. Because of our reticence to show mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh. And be also because often the engineering company for the case of engineering problems, mm -hmm. will be hired by um, the architects, or I forget the order in which these things happen, but the, the people in charge will have all these non-disclosure agreements with everyone else involved, and no one is allowed to say, we messed up, this was wrong, or even we learned this, right? And, and this was wrong. Information is exposure. Exactly. And so for the cases where I personally knew people, and they had told me their mistakes, <laughs> like over a drink. They, they, we, we, just talking about their day at work, they told me this went wrong, this went wrong. When I went back to them to say, hey, I'm writing a book, they were like, uh, who are you? I don't know. <laughs> right? They totally, they're like, there's no way you can use these stories. And so I think that is a major problem, specifically in engineering, where problems aren't shared. 
Well, and uh, you know that's the opposite of of the of the of the of the edifice of science, right? Exactly. Everything is shared. One of the things I love about the videos that Brady makes, and I I, I didn't realize it. Uh, until two things happened. One, Brady came to San Francisco, we had yeah. him on the podcast, and when I said, do you wanna be on the podcast, he said, you know that I don't know anything about math, right? That's true. And I was like, no, I didn't know that, because his questions are so terrific as he asks them, and sometimes his questions are, the answer is, I don't know. Exactly. You might, you, yep. you, he might ask you a question that's past the limit of your knowledge. And I find the good humor with which his interview subjects respond to be wonderful. Mm -hmm. And also his openness of like, well, I can still ask meaningful questions even though I don't oh, yeah. understand the starting principles. If, if our kind of career model is poly nerd, Brady is the, I'm gonna call him the poly idiot. I think that's, <laughs> he, he doesn't, like he's got an interest but doesn't know the details about a lot of areas. And so he's, he's perfect at asking these questions and he'll get right to the, hey, but what about this? And or, I, I don't get this bit. Or, and, it's so, and he's usually reading my mind at that point because I have the same exact question exactly. at that moment. He is the perfect, he's, this is where a lot of technical YouTube videos will fail. Brady is <laughs> the audience member in the room who just knows what everyone who's watching it is thinking and then ask that question. It is so That's important so to have that. There was a video that's going around recently on YouTube about math and I found it inscrutable and it made me a little sad because I really wasn't understanding their starting propositions and I was like, what is the, pro oh, the problem is they don't have Brady asking Bingo. the base level questions, yep. the most important ones. Exactly, so, yeah, it's such a good job. And it's important to show, number one, that with all these math things, you can ask. There's no silly questions. No, there are. What about this? Where'd that come from? Doesn't that mean this? Which is fine. Which is why I take any correction I get seriously. I'll flip through, I'll find it, and check if I got it right or wrong. And uh, secondly, the people he interviews, a little bit of selection bias here, sure. tend to be people who will very happily say, I don't know. Yeah. Or, or either, there's two different flavors of I don't know. There's I don't know, but it exists and I've forgotten it. Oh, or yeah. I don't know, but I could look it up. And then there's I'm not sure, and then there's Humankind just does not know. And and all of those are, are interesting for different To reasons. be honest, hearing any one of those from a teacher was surprising to me. And one of the very first teachers, sorry, uh, one of the very first teachers to say to me in response to a question, I don't know, was I literally felt like I'd unlocked a key to something because that wasn't a, a phrase I heard from a teacher. Yeah. And so I think that's one thing going back to the earlier question about inspiring kids. Tell them the limits of your knowledge. Absolutely, and I used to love teaching um, the higher year, high school years when I was teaching in the UK, because I'd walk in and we'd have the problem, and I go, "Well, let's work it out together, right?" right. And right. Uh, and I I viewed it as involving them in the process and showing them. Other people call it lack of lesson preparation, but we would <laughs> we would go through it together and get stuck, and we'd all sit back and like these are like small classes. Yeah. So yeah. You, you, I fully accept you very rarely get this luxury mm -hmm. because so many lessons you've got like 30 students that you've got to get the whole cohort working together and all advancing to hit a test by a date. So the luxury of, I don't know, let's all learn it together. Well, I, I, I totally, yeah. And so I have all sorts of great things to say about education, but no real pragmatic ways of putting them into practice. But I <laughs> used to love the luxury of just going, I don't know, and would work it out yeah. together and get stuck and come out of being stuck. And it's um, an important lesson. One of the best producers I had on Mythbusters was my friend Alice. And Alice was a very much a lay person who did not understand a lot of the science behind, or a lot of the complicated complexities of the things that Jamie and I were testing. And thus, she would not let us call a piece to camera done unless she understood what the hell we were talking about yeah. over and over and over again. And it was such a fantastic education. She was being the audience. Yeah. And thus we learned the, the, the hardest and the best way how to phrase something so that everyone could understand. Everyone needs a Brady. We really <laughs> do, we really do. Matt, um, I am so excited that you are barnstorming around the country promoting this. I loved this book. Sorry, I keep touching my mic. I loved this book. Uh, I'm very excited to promote a science book that goes into an area most people think is beyond them to find thrilling adventures. Wow, thanks so much. I mean, I'm, I'm so pleased that you've enjoyed it. It was a lot of work. Hopefully we'll get more people more excited about math. Uh, links to buy this uh, are below. And uh, if you have any other questions, uh, where can people find you online? 
I'm uh, on Twitter, Stand Up Maths, and on YouTube, of course, Number File we mentioned, and my own Stand Up Maths channel. If you go on there, I've got some videos about stuff in the book. And if you ask any questions, I'll try and answer them. Thanks. Matt, my pleasure. See you soon. Thanks, everybody.